My name is Nick, and I am a uh, membership clerk here at Do Space. I work a lot with digital media in my free time, and I've spent a lot of time practicing and learning things over the last few years. I don't just do photography; I do pretty much I do pretty much everything. I and everything from uh, rendering, like the stuff that Pixar does, to the more by hand stuff where you're drawing and painting, and everything in between. Uh, but today, more specifically, we are going to be focusing on phone photography. So today what we're going to do is I'm going to share some useful tips that, or not tips, more so, more so things that you can do to make your, pho excuse me, your photos look a lot better. And this isn't just work for just phone cameras. This works for pretty much any camera out there. So it could be like a, uh, like a fancy DSLR or a, uh, uh, just a handheld uh, digital camera, even a camera from like 10 or so years ago. It, uh, uh, it's going to work. All these things I'm going to share with you should work pretty much universally. So as far as to what we'll be going over today, we're gonna, going to be talking about something called the rule of thirds and lighting patterns. Using these two things, you can pretty much almost immediately improve the quality of the photographs that you take. Um, Something that I want to stress real quick, though, is that good photography does not come from having a super expensive camera. Now, technically speaking, yes, having a camera that can take higher resolution photos means that the photo, that the pictures that you get are going to be a lot higher quality. However, it's the tactics and the way the photos are taken that makes the photo good rather than just the technology. Obviously, if you could choose between an 8K resolution photograph versus a camera that takes photographs from like 20 years ago, you're going to have a lot more to work with if you use the camera from today, but you can still pull off some pretty awesome things with cameras that are old rather than just having the new stuff. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump right into it. We're going to start talking about the rule of thirds. So the rule of thirds, what is the rule of thirds? Well, to sort of slim it down and simplify it. The rule of thirds is this tic-tac-toe board, so to speak, that photographers can use. It's sort of a golden rule that helps us align things in our photographs in a way that makes things look a lot more appealing. And the reason why this works is because the lines force us to move things out of the center of the photograph and make everything sort of flow, so to speak. Uh, an example of what this would look like is here. So uh, on the left here, I have a photograph that I took without the rule of thirds. And then I have another one of the same object, same area, same scenario with the rule of thirds. You can easily see a humongous improvement already just from between these two photographs here. The one on the right looks a lot more, I don't want to say focused, but it looks more zeroed in. It's a lot easier to look at this one than it is to this one because we are controlling what is in the photograph with the rule of thirds. So, so, so how do we use the rule of thirds exactly? Well, uh, fortunately for us, uh, in the olden times before, <laughs> I don't want to say before modern technology, but before uh, we figured out that we can just put this on our cameras, you would have to imagine the rule of thirds through the lens of your camera. Nowadays, what we can actually do on our phones and even DSL, DSLR cameras is we can actually enable the, uh, the rule of thirds so that it displays. So uh, I know that there are some issues with the, the Google branded phones. I had a friend who was having trouble with uh, trouble with that, but I do know that on iPhones and most Android phones, if you go up into the top left corner uh, when you're in your camera, and you click on the set or tap on the settings, if you scroll down and just find something that says like use grid or enable grid, uh, that will turn on the rule of thirds, and you can start using it to make your photographs look a little bit better. Now, how this works is you got to use the lines in the intersection points uh, to align things up in your shot. And I'm going to have plenty of examples of this uh, real soon to share with you what I mean by align things in the shot, because certain lines do certain things better than others. Certain lines can have, or certain parts, I should say, can achieve uh, different effects. And as a piece of advice, uh, when you're taking photographs with the rule of thirds, try to avoid having your subject in the center of the photo. What I mean by your subject is I mean the focus of your uh, of the of the photograph that you're taking. So let's say uh, you're at a, 
a, a birthday party and you're trying to get a picture of the of the of the birthday person i guess <laughs> um you would want to try and use the lines to align him or her whichever um in the photograph rather than just have her in the center now make no mistake there's nothing wrong with having them in the center but sometimes having them off center and using this rule can make things look a lot more interesting the beautiful thing about photography and pretty much any art is technically speaking there are no rules however there are shall we say recommended guidelines that make things that can sort of churn out things a little bit better than uh, a little bit better than without so uh before i get too far here let's just if you have any questions by the way feel free to throw them into the chat i will do my best to keep an eye on them and answer them to the best of my ability but if i do miss them i do apologize in advance um but i will yeah if, if you do have questions seriously feel free to just throw them in the chat and i will do my best to keep up with them so now that we've talked about how we use the rule of thirds now i'm going to show you how you can use the rule of thirds. And we're gonna start off by talking about how we use the horizontal lines. So here I've got this awesome sunset sort of photo here. And if you go ahead and take a look at the lines here, go ahead and just ask yourself what line, there's something, one of these lines aligns with something in, this, in the photograph. If you can find it, awesome. If not, don't, don't worry about it. I'm gonna give you a moment to look around and see if you can find anything, that anything that the lines may line up with if you said to yourself hey that bottom line here this this horizontal line here aligns with the horizon here you would be completely right that's what i went, wanted you to find there if you didn't don't worry about it <laughs> so the horizontal lines and the rule of thirds are really great for these widespread sweeping shots you see what we're doing here is we're using these lines to again balance out the what takes up what's dominant in our photograph in this case you'll notice that these six rectangles here are predominantly the sky the sky is what's taking up the most um, space in our photograph but it's balanced because it's not the whole photograph see if i was to align the horizontal the uh the horizon here in the middle of our photograph it wouldn't look as good because things would be i don't want to say too balanced but they wouldn't be there. There's not that off centeredness that I mentioned earlier. So horizontal lines are really good for like any sort of wide shot kind of like this. If you align either the top or bottom line with the horizon, you get these really awesome, you get the awesome effect of emphasizing certain portions in your camera. I, I hope that makes sense. So for example, uh, since this is Nebraska, let's say you wanted to get a amazing shot of um say you were out out somewhere along there around Kearney and the sun was going down over the fields or the uh the the road there the what what she calls it i-80 you want to get that nice sunset sun sunset photo what you'd want to do is you'd want to take either one of these lines either the top or bottom and align that to the horizon to Control what takes up dominance in your photograph. If you're trying to get a picture of the sky, make sure that the bottom line uh, hits the bottom of the uh, hits the hits the horizon. Or if you wanted to get a photograph that was more particularly focusing on the ground, you would want to go ahead and align this uh, this top line here with the with the horizon. This is also great if you ever go to like a beach or anything and you want to get like a great photograph of the ocean or uh, uh, if, you're, if you ever visit the mountains, uh, that's another interesting thing that can, another great way to use the horizontal lines by themselves. Really, I wanna drive the point home here that the horizontal lines are really great for widespread uh, shots of long, long, like wide areas. They're also good for group photos, actually. So let's say you have uh, let's say you're having like a family photograph. What you'd want to do is you'd want to align this top line here with the uh, with the tallest person in your photograph. That way they don't stick up too far. But this is sort of this is case to case sometimes because sometimes we have more tall people in our family than we do short. It 
it's really it's worth it's tr- it's worth at least trying but i I'll, I'll warn you in advance it may not uh, it's not bulletproof <laughs> so this is what we can do with the horizontal lines um so how about how about the vertical lines what can we do with those well in a very similar way we use those to align tall objects in our photographs so if we use these to determine um uh sort of wide horizontal objects, I guess, <laughs> in our photographs. We want to use, whoop, sorry, we want to use these to sort of align and move things um, sort of left to right in our photographs. Think uh, these two lines, the horizontal ones think up and down, and for the vertical ones think left and right. Where should things be spaced out in this photograph? Uh, a lot of times, these uh, vertical lines are actually used by uh, people who are doing interviews to move the whoever is being the interviewee, so to speak, over off to the center of the camera. If you ever look uh, at an interview video, you'll notice that the person, the interviewee is never in the center. They're always off-centered because, again, it does this thing where our eye will move to them and move around the whole photo rather than just going straight to the center and not looking at what's around it. Uh, but anyway, more back to the specifics on these, on the vertical lines. What I like to do is I like to use them to bring out tall things in my photograph. So if let's, I'm going to use the, the landscape sunset shot again. Let's say the sun's going down and I'm by this really awesome looking clock tower. What I could do then is I could align this to the horizon. And then I could also align this vertical line here to the clock tower. It, I'm, I'm going to have an example of something kind of like that coming up here. Um, but generally speaking, if you were just going to use the vertical lines by themselves, you'd want to try and uh, align them to anything that is tall, basically. <laughs> anything that's got vertical. And you can also, you can flip this, by the way, since we're talking about mobile devices here. If you uh, change the orientation of your phone, so rather than having it um, so that it's horizontal like this, if you flipped it so that it was going long ways, you can also, um, the lines sort of change. These would become your, uh, your vertical, sorry, these would become your horizontal, and then these would become your vertical. It's just the same game where you got to make sure that you're lining up, um, you know, things that are vertical with the vertical lines and um, things that are horizontal with the horizontal lines. But there is one thing that we haven't mentioned yet, and that's going to be these intersects, intersection points here. So, what we can do with the intersection points is we can mark points, use them to sort of hone in on points of interest. I've got my marionette friend here. Um, what I've done with this point here is I have aligned uh, this point with his shoulder. Now what this does is your eyes will naturally go into this portion of the photo, unless I tell you that they do, then you'll purposefully not do that. But uh, if you didn't know any better, if the lines weren't there, your eyes would be drawn to this area on the, uh, on, in the photograph. Now, as far as good photographs go, I would not say this is a very great one. This is just sort of a very uh, 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 a sort of raw example of how to use a point of interest to mark something. Um, generally, what you would want to do is you would want to align these points with more, shall we say, intriguing things in your photograph. Like if I had found a way to align this with my friend's head here instead, that would have probably been a lot better. But again, for the sake of examples, this is what it would look like to align something in our, uh, in our intersection points here. So the real fun begins when we use two, rather than just one line, we use two of them in tandem to create new effects. So, uh, if you recognize this photo from earlier, the reason why it looks so well is because I'm actually using at least two or three uh, different uh, things in our, in our little grid here to uh, improve the photograph. I'll go ahead and let you take a look at this guy. If you can figure out which ones I'm using here, you'll see right away what I mean by using these, uh, these lines to improve things. So if you hadn't noticed yet, uh, right along the bottom here, I've got the one of the horizontal lines running pretty close to, it doesn't have to be right on it, by the way. It, it just has to be close. Uh, if you don't, I mean, 
the closer, I guess, the better, but it does not have to be like dead on the line all the time. <laughs> it just has to be a little bit closer to it. But the table I have here is running pretty darn close to the, uh, the horizontal line I've got here. And then in the center of the camera where it's darkest is where I've aligned one of the intersection points to, uh, uh, to, to draw our eye in. Generally speaking, things that are dark or that have uh, dark, like outstanding dark things or outstanding bright things will draw our eyes in. And depending on how they're laid out, they can make things look better. But uh, here we have an example where I've used a horizontal line as well as a uh, intersection point. But you can even take it even further if possible. It's not always it's not always the most possible, but it is sometimes possible to get all uh, all to get multiple things in here besides just two. For this example, if we have any Doctor Who fans in the audience this evening, you're in for a treat. If not, don't worry about it. Um, so here on my little friend's uh, eye here, we have another intersection point, but we also again have this horizontal line running here, but we also have this vertical line running down the, uh, running right down the middle of our, uh, of our little character here. And what this has done is this has spaced out everything else in the photograph, background and all, so that he technically takes up most of our photo here. I guess I shouldn't say most of, but he does take up a very considerable amount of the photograph. He's in at least all six of these, uh, all six of these rectangle, uh, rectangles made by the grid here, and has left uh, three empty, just again like uh, earlier with our horizontal photograph, where um, the ground only took up three, and the sky took up, again, all six. So to sort of wrap this all in a neat bow, we use the rule of thirds to position things in a way that is a lot more aesthetically pleasing in our photographs. Uh, I would definitely recommend uh, if you take anything away from this webinar, take away the rule of thirds, go out there and just try it. You'll, I guarantee you will instantly see improvements. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so before we move on too far here, or yeah, before we move on here, I would, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pause if anybody has a question seriously feel free to throw it in the chat now uh, otherwise we'll go ahead and move on to the next subject but i'll, I'll give you a few minutes to uh, drop anything in the chat if you uh, would like to Okay, I think I see one here from Amanda. She asks, what if someone is, uh, what if someone is dancing or doing yoga? Would you use the hand, body, or head? Ah, okay, so that's a really good question. Okay, so generally speaking, uh, when we are taking photographs of someone from far away rather than up close, you want to align one of the intersection points with their face. Now, if it's a yoga, that can be a little bit more difficult since yoga, you know, you're bending all over the place. Um, here's what I would do. I would think about this from a, from a top to bottom perspective or a top to bottom sort of mindset. I would align uh, whatever is the tallest point of their body at the point. So if they have like their hand up in the air or something like that, I would try and see if maybe you can align the horizontal line with uh, the, the topmost horizontal line with their hand. Or maybe what you could do is you could try and align um, a, one of the uh, vertical lines with, uh, with, with their spine, I guess. <laughs> Um, but generally speaking for that, I would definitely try, um, hmm. that's a very interesting question because <laughs> there are lots of different yoga poses and dancing is, well, dancing. 
So I would say, generally speaking, it would, it's really sort of a case by case. But as far as my tip would go, it would really debate about the position. So if you're trying to get a, 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 uh, an all-encompassing body shot, uh, definitely use the top line to uh, use the top horizontal line to uh, well, I just lost my train of thought here. Use the top horizontal line, sorry, to uh, position their position them. Or if you're doing an up close one, um, like where you have an up close on their face, another thing you can do is use the intersection points to uh, on use the intersection points on their eyes. That's another popular thing that a lot of uh, portrait photographers portrait photography that's a very popular thing in portrait photography my bad <laughs> uh, I, I hope that answers your question a little bit more uh, due to the complex nature of all that stuff uh, it's really sort of a case-by-case -case thing no problem uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and move on here uh, go ahead and move on to lighting patterns now before we really dive into this, I would like to sort of put aside and say, when it comes to any sort of visual media, lighting is almost everything. <laughs> lighting controls what we see, lighting can control how we feel about what we're seeing. And to really sort of understand lighting, you have to understand the physics of lighting. And there's just a bunch of other stuff. Today, not going to dive into that. We're actually, I'm just going to keep it simple, silly simple. So Treat lighting like, um, hmm. treat lighting sort of like it's a broad basic topic. Light is here, we see this. Real simple stuff. So that begs the question then, what is a lighting pattern then? Well, imagine this. You are taking a picture of an individual. They're over here, nice and smiley. And your camera is here and your light, your main light, which is also referred to as a key light, is here. That's gonna give you a very specific type of lighting. Now, we can get a different type of lighting by simply moving this light over here or over here. What that is, is where your light is, how it's arranged, that is what we call a lighting pattern. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different lighting patterns out there that you can use. Today, we're gonna go through some of the five basic ones. We've got flat lighting, paramount, loop, Rembrandt, and split lighting. Each of these have their uses and have been used in professional media all over the place. Um, as we go down this list, I'll say that things will get more dynamic. More, there'll be more, what I mean by dynamic is there'll be more shadow versus light or vice versa, more light versus shadow. Uh, by the end of this, we'll get to a point where there is 50% light and 50% shadow. Go figure, it's split. But uh, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna jump right into each of the examples of what this looks like. So first and foremost, flat lighting is exactly what it sounds like. Flat lighting makes our subject look flat. Light is directly on our subject from where the camera is and there are no shadows on them whatsoever. Uh, when you're thinking about flat lighting, like what is flat lighting, just remember a camera flash. That's basically what flat lighting is, is when the light comes directly from our camera onto our subject. And this lighting is really popular with uh, newscasts, uh, uh, sitcom television shows, stuff like The Office, The Big Bang Theory, all that kind of stuff. It looks a little something like this. I brought my marionette friend back here. We can see that there are very little shadows on him. Uh, Sure, we've got a little bit here and there, but for the most part, he's pretty much well lit. The reason why it's called flat lighting besides being flat is it also makes our subject look flat. Shadows add this thing that we call depth, and depth makes things look more three-dimensional, which is sometimes a more desired effect, sometimes not. It really all comes down to what type of photo you're trying to take. For casual, super simple stuff, I would recommend something like flat lighting. Now, there are other styles similar to flat lighting that we're gonna talk about here in just a moment that also will get the job done. Me, personally, I'm not a big fan of flat lighting. I just think it looks boring, looks, mm, it just looks boring to me. But next up on our list, we have a lighting style that's very similar and it's called paramount lighting or also butterfly lighting. 
What we have done now is we have taken the light and we have moved it up slightly above our subject. It's now casting some slight amounts of shadow and is adding a little bit, an ounce, a very trace ounce of depth to our subject. And the reason why it is called butterfly lighting sometimes is because when doing this, um, it will cast the shadow of a butterfly underneath our subject's nose. If you're taking photographs of a person, it'll look like there's a little butterfly underneath their nose. Um, now, it looks a little bit something like this. We can see right here that the light is coming from up above and it's coming down. And we've, we've got some shadow here on the, uh, on the torso here, a little bit underneath the chin, uh, on the sides of the face too, and a little bit underneath the arms. It's, it's added a very tiny amount of shadow, ever so slight, but noticeable. This is one of my favorite types of lighting just because I like the way it highlights, it highlights things. And uh, now you're probably wondering, okay, it's called butterfly lighting, but why does it say paramount lighting? Good question. So if you're familiar with Paramount Studios, the company out there that makes movies like, uh, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank, uh, movies like Transformers, Ninja Turtles, all of that kind of stuff. Um, back in the early 19, I want to say 50s or 50s or 60s, the very early days of Hollywood, Paramount would actually use this type of lighting on their female subjects to outline their cheekbones and their facial structure. Nowadays, it's used pretty much for anything and by anyone, but uh, that's actually where it came from. Uh, so it, it, for comparison, if you were curious, this is what it would look like. This is what butterfly lighting looks like. And then we're compared to flat lighting. Oop, that's the wrong way. So flat lighting, paramount lighting. I personally would always take paramount over butterfly lighting just because I think it just looks that much more interesting. And it just, I guess, <laughs> it doesn't look flat. How about that? <laughs> Now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna move on to uh, loop lighting. Now loop lighting is where we start to get uh, lighting that is from the, uh, uh, it's coming from the side. It's starting to cast a shadow to one side of our subject here. So imagine if you were to look at this from a top down view, if our subject was here and our camera was here, our light would be somewhere over here now. And what this does, is, as I said, it starts to cast more shadow to one side of the subject. Now on people, this will actually cast a small loop, sort of circular shadow uh, from their nose to one side of their body. Unfortunately, I, as you've probably figured out already, I don't, I could not find a, uh, a volunteer to take photographs with. So be it, COVID has made things a little bit more difficult. But rest assured, if you go out there and you, uh, you Google loop lighting or pretty much any of these at this point, any of these uh, patterns, you'll find examples of people and you'll see the stuff that I'm talking about, the, the butterfly shadow, the loop shadow, the flat lighting. I mean, any, any screen cap from the office will show you flat lighting, I promise. <laughs> but anyway, here, what I was talking about, the lighting to one side, you'll notice here that one section or one side rather of our uh, character here is more in light and then one is more in shadow. This is where we start to slowly delve into the more dynamic and dramatic lighting styles because we're increasing the amount of depth in our photograph. More shadow means more depth, more drama, if you will. Uh, generally speaking, this is still, I mean, these are all good for a for, uh, portrait lighting or portrait, portrait photos, but some have different feelings than others. Uh, up to this point, I would say everything is pretty calm, lighthearted, not very dramatic. After this one is when we really start to dive more into the more hardcore, uh, cinematic type looking lighting styles where things are super exaggerated. There's tons of shadow, tons of depth, all that stuff. But this is a, uh, this is a sort of doorway into the more intense lighting patterns. I don't use this one very much. Um, just because I don't, <laughs> I either go full throttle or no, no throttle, I guess. <laughs> um, but it, it's a very good compromise in between soft lighting and hard lighting, shall we say. Next up, we're gonna have what we call Rembrandt lighting. 
Now, Rembrandt lighting is very similar to loop lighting in the fact that it's still coming from the side or coming at our subject from an angle, but it's not directly from the side. It's, it's not directly to the left. So again, if we were to imagine our subject from a bird's eye view looking down, camera was around here, rather than have our light over here or here, it would be in between these two points, still pointed at the, the subject, mind you, um, which would again increase the amount of shadow on our subject. Uh, one of the uh, one of the key things that Rembrandt lighting does with uh, with uh, uh, with people is that it will uh, cast this sort of triangular. It will make this triangular pattern on their cheek opposite of their uh, opposite of where the light is coming. So coming from. So if uh, the light was here, we would have this triangular pattern on our uh, on our subject here. And here, uh, as sort of a uh, comparison, if we go back to loop lighting here, we can see that we've got some slight shadows. But if we come in here, we start to see that there's a lot more going on here. We've got more defined shadows, a lot more, uh, a lot darker shadows too. And then we can see that it's starting to slowly sweep over the face here. It hasn't totally taken over yet, but it is starting to. We can see that the arm here has a lot more shadow to it. The torso here definitely has a lot more shadow to it. Um, I would say if you're trying to take a more dramatic looking portrait, but not trying to go overboard with the drama, I suppose, um, Rembrandt is going to be your guy. Rembrandt is one of my favorite lighting styles because it adds a lot more shadow, a lot more depth, but it doesn't add too much. Our next pattern, I would say, adds a little bit too much for me, but sometimes it's fun to use just to see how crazy you can make things go. But as far as respectable, or not respectable, as far as professional grade looking uh, portraits, portrait, excuse me, portraits would go, I would say Rembrandt is where you'd want to stop um, as far as uh, taking, like if you were like doing a photograph that you wanted to put in a frame on the wall, I'd say Rembrandt is where you'd want to stop and as far as uh, taking photographs like that, taking portraits like that. Next, we have what we call split lighting. Split lighting is exactly what it sounds like. It's going to split the light right down our subject. The light is now coming from a 90 degree angle. So we were looking down at them, uh, bird's eye view. Subject was here, camera was down here. Our light would be over here or over here. So what it does is it will light our subject in half. It will it'll light half of our subject, and then we'll keep the other half in dark in darkness. This is what I call this is probably the most dramatic lighting style that we've got on on our little list today, just generally because of how fifty fifty it is. Here is what it would look like to actually use the split lighting. As you can see, we literally you can almost see an imaginary line just running right down the middle of our subject here each part of them's got some sort of shadow to them. So the, uh, the arm here has shadow mostly over here. The torso here has got a shadow there. And even this arm here has got a little shadow here. And this is actually a really popular uh, lighting pattern with uh, athletic, uh, athletic, athletic portraits. Uh, athletes who do uh, lots of working out, all that stuff. Uh, they like to use split lighting for their portraits, interestingly, because it highlights their muscles actually. Um, if you go out there and you look for like, um, I'm sure if you look for like Under Armour advertisements, you'll find some split lighting, some split lighting photographs or even a Nike advertisement. You'll see some sort of examples of split lighting. And even then, it's not only them that use uh, this sort of style of lighting. This is a very cinematic uh, lighting style. If you look into uh, movie posters, I'm sure you'll find something that's using split lighting on one of them. I can't name any examples off the top of my head, but trust me, it's out there. So I've presented all of these to you and we'll, we'll, we'll run back through and we'll do a little bit of a recap here. So flat lighting is flat lighting, light that comes right from the camera. Butterfly lighting is the lighting that comes from slightly above our subject. Remember not to go too high though, because sometimes that'll give you adverse effects that you don't want. So be sure not to go too high, just high enough. So that's butterfly lighting. Then we have loop lighting where we start to add shadow to one side of our subject. 
ever so slightly though, not too much. That's the, the 45 degree angle. Then we have Rembrandt lighting where we uh, increase the amount of shadow to a much greater, more dramatic looking uh, angle. And then we have split lighting where we are at a complete 90 degree angle. Half of our subject is in light, half of it is in dark. So I've shared with you each of these patterns. Now here comes the real trick. Here comes the real test, if you will. How do I use these patterns exactly? Great question. And, I, and this is where I've got some good news and some bad news. We're gonna start with the bad news. The bad news is doing these outside is rather difficult from my experience. If I'm sure there are better ways to do it, but from my experience, not so much. So in order to use these light patterns on the outside, you have to remember what a light pattern is. A light pattern is where the light is in relation to our subject. Well, easy. <laughs> if you think about that, normally you would say, okay, well, if I want a different light pattern, I just have to move the light, right? Well, if you're outside, your lighting is probably going to be coming from the sun. So good luck moving that. If you find a way to, let me know because uh, I would be interested. <laughs> so when we're taking photographs outside, what you'd want to do is you'd have to wait for the right time of day. That's one way to do it. it I call it the long way where you just got to gotta wait for that right time and the right period. When the sun is at the right angle that you're looking for, uh, that's when you go out and take your photographs. However, there is an issue. Uh, sometimes we don't have time for these things. So an interesting thing that we can do instead is we can move our subject so that the light hits them in a different way. So rather than move all of the lights, rather than wait for the sun, I can, uh, if I want my flat lighting from the sun, I can just turn my body and move my camera in relation so that um, I get the lighting that I'm looking for. So t for example, so let's say I am taking photographs at sunrise because I want some sort of split lighting from the sun. What you would do is you would stand facing north or south as the sun began to rise and the light would hit you from the side. But then again, if I wanted to change that again suddenly and I wanted flat lighting, all I have to do is turn my subject 90 degrees and I've got flat lighting. Now it's not always gonna be that simple, unfortunately. I wish it were. But by moving your subject, you can change the lighting that, you can change how the light hits them a lot easier. Now, what gets interesting is when we talk about doing this inside. Inside is probably, if you're going to be messing around with lighting patterns, you're gonna have a lot easier time doing it inside rather than outside. Now, inside you can use the whole move the subject if you don't wanna move the lights thing, but also since you're, since you can control the lights now, you could also move them too if you wanted to. But depending on how many lights you have, if you only have the one, or depending on what the light you're using is, like if you're just using a ceiling lamp, you're not gonna be able to move that very easily. <laughs> so you'll again have to move your subject rather than move your, uh, uh, move your lights. However, we're gonna talk about using light patterns indoors and, and how you'd wanna go about doing that a little bit more in depth here. First things first, when you're trying to take photographs inside and you're trying to control the light in the best way possible, you're going to want to do what I call create a studio. So what you wanna do is you want to find a room in the building that you're in that has either no windows or as little windows, as few windows as possible. If you can't find a room that doesn't have any windows, uh, do your best to block out the light with like um, uh, uh, curtains, blankets. Uh, I myself at my apartment that I'm at, I, I have trifolds. We poster board trifolds used at science fairs and stuff. I use that to block out the light because uh, I don't have any curtains. <laughs> um, it works relatively all right. Uh, what you're trying to do, what the goal is to do here is to eliminate as much outside or uncontrolled light as possible. Now, if you really wanted to do this, another thing you could do is you could wait until night, but if you're like me and you're not patient enough for that, blocking out the windows is the way to go. <laughs> now, hmm, perhaps I should have told you to do this next part before all of that, but 
Um, now you want to clear a space uh, where you're, for, for you to take these photographs. Uh, yes, probably do that before you knock out all of the lights <laughs> um, so that you can uh, see what you're doing. But um, yes, in all seriousness, you will want to create a space, an empty space for your, uh, your subject to sit where you can take photographs and things like that. A controlled space. So that, that way you don't have to uh, work around things and move things out of the way. Like, let's say if you were in the middle of a, like a living room or something, and you got all these pieces of furniture, unless you want them to be part of the photograph, I would say maybe find a corner where you can set things up and uh, sort of position your lights that way around easier and work around everything. That way you can control the space a lot easier rather than having this wide open area where you have to, you know, worry about all sorts of things. Having a enclosed small area where it's been cleared out so that you can take care, uh, or sorry, not take care, so you can manipulate all the things that you're working with, it's gonna be a lot easier on you than it would be to um, work in a public area from my experience, I guess. Uh, and the last thing to do would be to gather and position your light sources. To me, this is the fun part. Because positioning your light sources can be a very creative and fun process. Because the thing about lighting is, the thing about make, uh, picking lights for your scene is that they don't have to be these expensive $400,000, you know, lights. They don't have to come from like, um, they don't have to be expressively photography lights. My philosophy is if it makes light, it is a light source. If it is a light source, I can use it to take photographs. Now, this doesn't always work out the way this doesn't, this isn't a golden, uh, this isn't a golden parachute. It's not bulletproof, but I have gotten a lot of interesting results from this. What I mean by a light source, if it is a light source, I mean, there are a lot of different sources around you, a lot of different things that you can use to make light. Desk lamps, overhead lights, uh, holiday lights like string lights from Christmas, display screens. Display screens are one of my most, uh, probably my most beloved item on this list. Uh, the photographs that we saw earlier with, uh, with, with our lighting patterns, um, the light I used to take those was a light from an iPad screen actually. That's what I mean by display screens. If, it, if it's like a monitor, a TV, iPad screen, phone screen, anything like that, if it makes light, you can use that to change and orient your lighting. Now, some lights are gonna work a lot better than others and some lights are gonna have different effects. But an interesting thing that you can do with these display screens, with, these, with the screen lighting, I mean, is you can Google or just basically any, any internet search of a color, just any color. So uh, search the color uh, uh, green, let's, let's use the color green. You can go out there and you can find a picture that is a solid, you know, it's just solid green. You can use that to add lighting into your photograph that's not only bright, but it's also green. So it's a good way to introduce color in your photographs as well. If you're trying to get some crazy, uh, unusual lighting sort of, stylistic stuff going on there. Uh, I have used that several times and I gotta say it is a lot of fun. Uh, definitely if you try any of these out, try lighting things with a TV screen. I guarantee you're gonna get some interesting results. Next on the list we got candles, campfire, you know, be careful. It is fire after all. <laughs> be safe. LED strips, lava lamps. The bottom line is if it makes light, you can use it to add light to your scene in an interesting and thought-provoking way. Some of the coolest things come from the areas that we never suspect. So next time you're looking at looking out for things, just remember, hey, that emits light. Maybe I can use that in a photograph. Maybe I can do something interesting with that. Let's see here. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up the open up one more time to take uh, questions one more time uh, for the uh, for the evening. After that, I think I'm gonna wrap things up and present you with surprise your challenge. That's right, I have a challenge for you uh, for everyone who is watching this evening, uh, in the hopes that you will participate. If you don't, hey, don't feel bad about it. But hey, 
So we'll go ahead and take a couple minutes here to answer any questions anybody may or may not have uh, in the chat here. And if you if you need me to go over anything again, I would definitely be happy to uh, happy to do that for you. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. That's just fine. So I think we'll go ahead and move on here and I will present you with your challenge. So here's your challenge. I challenge you to go out and use what you've learned to make at least one, at least one good photograph and share it with us on Facebook. So go right out there and just take the photograph, uh, take, take a photograph that you're comfortable sharing, of course, upload it to Facebook and say at do space, thank you for, or just mention at do space and say at do space and then mention phone photography or, or whatever, or hey, you don't have to do it if you don't want to, but it would be really awesome if you did. We love seeing what people do with the, uh, with the work or with the, the programs that we've been offering around here. Um, uh, yeah, that's pretty much going to be it from me tonight. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining me this evening. I'm very happy to share what I know. Um, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I guess that's going to conclude things for tonight. Um, so again, thank you all for joining me, and have a lovely evening.